Hi everyone and welcome to our 2022 PDB Art Exhibition opening event. Um, while we still have people joining the call, I'll just run through the slide we have here, which gives you a bit of information about the, the webinar software and, and how it's going to work. Um, so for attendees, all microphones will be kept muted throughout the event. Uh, if you do have a question, and we will have a Q&A session later, um, please type this into the Zoom Q&A box. So you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we'll try and get through as many as we can, but we do have a, only a short period of time for the Q&A. And finally, at the end of the event, uh, when the when you close or you leave the Zoom call, uh, then there will be a feedback survey that launches. And we'd be really grateful if you could fill that out, a bit of information about um, how you found out about the event and what you enjoyed and perhaps would improve about the event as well. So that really helps us to plan our future engagement events. And the final thing I just want to reiterate is that this event will be recorded and we'll then um, add that to our website, but also to our YouTube channel as well. Okay, so I think we've had a bit of time for people to, to join. So I'm sure we'll have more people join in as well, but um, we will begin with um, just giving you an overview of the program. So DT, if you could just move to the next slide. Um, so to begin with, uh, we'll have a welcome from our Director General at EMBL, um, Professor Edith Hurd. Uh, follow, following that, we'll have um, Irina Veshanova, uh, who is a structural biology researcher, will give us a bit of a, an overview of how she's um, worked in, in science and, and art and brought those together with some, some wonderful artworks. And then we're going to show you the art from this year and give you a guided tour of our virtual PDB art exhibition. At the end of the session, you can go and explore this at your leisure, but just to give you an idea of, of some of the pieces. We'll then have our question and answer session. Um, and as I say, throughout the event, please feel free to add questions in the Q&A box. And we will put these to Edith and Arena during the Q&A session. And finally, um, we'll have some question, uh, some prize announcements, and we'll also have some concluding remarks as well before we finish at six o'clock. Uh, so hopefully all will go well. Um, so I'd now like to, I'm really pleased to introduce Edith Hurd, who is the Director General of EMBL. Um, so Edith obtained her bachelor degree in genetics from the University of Cambridge, followed by a PhD at the Imperial College London. And she later moved to, Ch moved to France with her research focused mainly on genetics and developmental biology. And she's worked at various institutes in Paris, including the Pasteur Institute and the Curie Institute, which is where she uh, set up her own lab. And in January 2019, uh, Edith took up the role as Director General at EMBL, overseeing the direction of our institute and including the development of um, the five-year, a very ambitious five-year EMBL scientific program uh, on molecules to ecosystems, which we've begun this year. Um, so, so now I want to hand over to Edith to formally introduce uh, this year's virtual art exhibition. So Edith, over to you. Great, thank you so much, uh, David. Thank you, everyone. Um, I actually, I'm really, really happy to be introducing um, this exhibition. And uh, I was over at uh, EBI, a few months ago and actually got to to see and handle some of the objects and um, I'm a huge fan so aside from being the director general at EMBL I am a huge fan so it is a, a true pleasure to introduce uh, this year's opening and it, it actually is one of EMBL's longest running and most successful public engagement pro, pro projects um, so PDB art um, you know has been out there for for quite some time and huge success so I really want to congratulate the organizing team who've uh, put this together and done a fantastic job in keeping the project going um, throughout the pandemic and continuing to grow and inspire more and more young people every year. And I think that's something that, you know, we should all of us be aspiring to uh, trying to inspire the young is uh, actually, I think, one of the most important things that we can do as a scientific organization. 
So EMBL's European Bioinformatics Institute, or EBI, um, hosts uh, PDBE, and this is a world leading source of biological and biomolecular data. So you can think of uh, EBI as a huge sort of digital library where you can find all sorts of information on all species, all genes, all chemicals, proteins, and their structures and more. So anyone can access the data and there are millions of researchers around the world who use this data every day to really advance uh, knowledge, discovery, and understand the world that we live in. So our mission is to try and keep this data flowing to the scientific community and to make discoveries that benefit mankind and the planet. So um, really, this is you know, one of the, the main things that we want to do is to try and help train the next generation of scientists, of engineers, and of data experts. So science um, on its own can't actually deliver all the solutions. And we need to be able to reach out uh, to different disciplines and, and to tackle you know, some of the global challenges that we face today. And obviously, these include climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, the threats to human health, such as the pandemic that we've been living through. And we really need people to work as teams from lots of different professions. And that includes artists, creators, and engineers. And science is a shared endeavor. So we need to try and engage young people with science as early as possible. And EMBL has been working with schools for many, many years to try and provide inspiring and engaging activities that can make our science and our technologies as accessible as possible to the new generation. It's actually becoming easier thanks to the many, many different uh, uh, formats and media that we can use. Um, and that's why I think this PDB art exhibition is, is fantastic. And the fact that it's happening on Zoom um, is, is an example of, of just how uh, creative one can be now. So we've recently brought together our education and en engagement activities into a new office that we've called Science Education and Public Engagement, uh, and which we know will, will try to continue to deliver lots of fantastic things to our member states. Um, who truly value these outreach efforts. I often get asked the question when I go to a member state or when I'm talking to a ministry, what are you doing in terms of outreach, in terms of reaching out to young people, teachers, um, and the public in general? So, um, so last but not least, I just want to say um, something about, you know, what, what we do here at EMBL. Um, you know, biology is truly beautiful. In fact, um, when I was... Uh, a student, I was I was going to be an astronomer. I thought that stars were beautiful, and and I I was a physicist, and I thought, okay, with astronomy, I can I can you know, uh, you know, make my dream of uh, the beauty of the sky and and physics coming together. But when I discovered biology, um, I realized that life is beautiful, biology is beautiful, and um, I think this is uh, this is what's so fantastic about what we we do at Emble. We're very lucky because we get to see these amazing. Um, images and and data sets and experience the thrill of getting these new insights into how life actually works at the molecular level. So projects like PDB Art really help us to share that beauty with others. And this is a really valuable thing. So for me, this is one of the most important endeavors we can have. And so I wish you all very all well, and I'll, I'll stay here and, and I'll be there for the questions and answers. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the, the, the other presentations and, and seeing some of the wonderful things that you've done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edith. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're quite lucky at PDB that we have such visual science that we can use to, to inspire people. Um, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so uh, our next uh, speaker is Irina Beshanova. Uh, we're delighted she can join us today. Um, so last year in October, um, Irina created a new artwork every day as part of the Inktober social media campaign. So this was using specific prompts and she integrated molecular structures into these artworks. Um, and it was a big hit with the structural bioinformatics community on, on Twitter. So what we did is is we we've collated these exhibition uh, these artworks into a virtual exhibition um, that we uh, have shown in the background here, um, and Arena will talk a bit more about this in her presentation. 
Um, but just to tell you a bit more about um, Irina. So she was born in Yalta, which is part of Crimea in Ukraine. She studied her undergraduate degree at Lomonosov Moscow State University in Russia, studying biology and bioorganic chemistry. She then did her PhD at the University of Toronto in Canada with Dr. Julie Foreman Kay. And there she was studying protein folding with NMR. She then continued her research in structural biology with a postdoc with Dr. Cheryl Arasmith at the Toronto Structural Genomics Consortium. And then in 2010, she joined the University of Connecticut Health Center, where she's now associate professor at the Department of Molecular Biology and Biophysics. And her role in her research there focuses on enzymes in a ubiquitin proteasome pathway and their role in cancer and in neurodevelopmental diseases. So we're delighted, as I say, to have Arena with us. So I'll now invite Arena uh, to turn on her camera and, and share her slides. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing about your experiences of combining science and art. So Arena, over to you. Thank you so much, David. Okay, let's see. Share. Okay. Um, thank you so much, David, for a wonderful introduction. I am incredibly excited to be here. And I think the work that you do is just absolutely fantastic and absolutely essential for the future. So what I would like to talk to you today about is art and science and combining art and science together. And it's not something that we usually think about as two things that come together, but as a, especially uh, a biologist, I think I agree with you that we see so much beauty in what we do. And it would be really amazing to be able to share this with everybody else. So PDB art for me is, an, is inspiration by the beauty of invisible world because really all these molecular structures that only become um, surface become visible and appreciated after scientists put a lot of work into actually visualizing them so visualization is just as important as science behind it and so i want to begin with a, a huge thank you to everybody involved in this project i think this project is absolutely fantastic for the future it's really important for science as it is and it's really important for um, going forward and inspiring new generations to um, do more science or to think more about science or not to be afraid of science. So I have a huge thank you to everybody who was organizing this, who was carrying this forward, the students that were participating, the teachers the, that guided this effort. Um, I think this effort is fantastic. So thank you. Um, of course, none of this could be possible without a depository, the three-dimensional depository of protein structures and other biomolecular structures. And PDB is absolutely essential for this. This is just a screenshot of a global um, PDB um, depository. It is a global, um, accessible, searchable depository of 3D structures that are available to everybody for free anytime they want. Um, there are about 200,000 structures in the PDB right now, and anybody can use them, and every and anybody and people do use them every day, um, mostly for scientific reasons. But I hope in the future they will also um, provide inspiration for more and more art, as we'll see today um, at this beautiful exhibit. Uh, PDB E was involved in creating this PDB art project and, and leading this PDB art project. Um, why this is important? It is incredibly important because um, it makes science more accessible. If you listen to what students um, tell you after they finish this project, they pretty much all tell you that they not necessarily thought that they're interested in science until or, or realize how beautiful science could be until they started this project. And I think that's the big goal, to make sure we engage students and um, make this make this opportunity for them to, um, to do more art and to be inspired by science. And perhaps somebody will get inspired and want to do science in the future. Um, 
So one important point here is to inspire interest in science, but we also do inspire new art, the art that, that artists may not have thought about, may not have ever considered. So we provide these new models for them by combining art um, and science, especially on a molecular level. And why this is important for education, because anybody who participates in this project, I'm sure know by now how important it was to research the subject. It's the biggest part of creating this art. Um, and for me, when I was doing my Inktober project, which I will talk about later, um, most of the time of the day that I dedicated to um, the drawing actually took researching the PDB, reading the papers about the molecules I'm looking at, and li really learning um, about the proteins I'm about to depict. So this is a big part that connects art and science together. Um, I want to give credit to several people who started this beautiful movement of appreciating and visualizing uh, the beauty of mo on a molecular level. And um, these are the three icons that I want to mention. One of them is Ivan Gase. So he was one of the first molecular illustrator. He was trained as a, an art architect and um, an artist. And he was the first person who was um, essentially depicting protein structure before we had any software or any good way of looking at them in 3D. So this was the dawn of structural biology. The very first crystal structures came out and we needed a way to visualize them. As you can see in this present in, in his um, myoglobin structure drawing that he did in 1961, he literally had to draw on every single bond um, in this molecule. And not only do you have to show it and, and make it look beautiful, you also have to make sure that it's all correct. And that's another really important part of um, scientific illustration as well. Um, in 1987, his beautiful drawing of uh, myoglobin came out that uh, was, as you can appreciate, way, way more stylized and really artistic. And I just love this drawing of his. So he became sort of the father of um, illustrating molecular structural biology. We have to give, give credit to um, Jane Richardson. So she is known as mother. Um, of ribbon diagrams. So if you go, if we go back to the original drawings of our proteins just as bonds, you can see how difficult it might be to look at them or make sense of them or present them to other people. So she simplified protein structure representation and essentially create, created this um, type of diagram called ribbon diagram which is used every day right now in all structural biology presentations. Pretty much every structural biology paper published will have uh, a representation like this. Um, she was an amazing scientist. She was one of the first crystallographers to create crystallographers that solved two of the first 20 um, X-ray structures of proteins in, in her day. Um, but she also felt the need of being able to show what she learns um, to other people. And she didn't think she was an artist or was good at drawing anything else, but she, she felt the need of, um, of visualizing the science that she did. And so she created these absolutely gorgeous um, drawings of protein structures. So in this case, she used ink and either colored pencils or pastels to create these very accurate um, and simplified uh, uh, representations of protein structures. Um, and I still, I still enjoy using them and, and I'm sure every other structural biologist does as well. And you will see a lot of these types of representations in today's art exhibit as well. She actually used um, a belt and twisted it over just to see how it would fold um, to create an inspiration of this beautiful art. Finally, um, David Goodsell is, is, is one of the probably most famous in our days um, artists, molecular artists. So he 
follows into the steps of creating art that's not only beautiful, but also useful. Um, in his art, he uses watercolor and ink, and he shows these beautiful representations of accurate um, molecular structures. He shows them in a simplified way, but he takes good care of showing the size of them that is um, absolutely accurate. And so that creates an accurate picture of what, um, what the biology might look like. And in this case, there are two examples. One of them is the um, COVID-19 vaccine um, and one of the mRNA vaccines created not so long ago to fight the pandemic that we all went through, um, as well as in this case, um, COVID um, viral particles surrounded by plasma and neutralizing antibodies here in um, yellow. It's absolutely stunning, but also incredibly useful. So what is my story? My story, I'm not an artist, I am a scientist. Um, I did study art a little bit when I was much younger. Um, and during COVID pandemic, I wanted to do some more art. So I joined this movement called Inktober, where um, every day of October, you create an art piece or drawing, something simple or something complex, really depends on you, based on the prompt that you're given. And it's a global movement, so a lot of people around the world will work on the same thing, and it's really up to your interpretation. I've done this several times now, and I pretty much failed every time I would start, because it was really difficult to find time and to complete that everyday routine task and find inspiration every day. Um, in 2020, during COVID, I actually completed my first series and it felt really good. So the next year I decided to try it again and 2021 was the year where I, I've chosen to be a little bit more creative with my prompt list. And uh, for each prompt, I really tried to find a molecule in the PDB that can be connected to this prompt or inspired by this prompt. It was really difficult to do by myself. So I engaged with the um, Twitter scientific community and I would post the next day's prompt and I would ask people to give me suggestions. And sometimes people did, sometimes didn't, but it was incredibly hopeful. So my first prompt was crystal, and I thought, well, crystal would be so easy. You know, most structures in the PDB are crystal structures, and we can pick almost anything. Um, but then it also became really difficult because almost every structure in the PDB is a crystal structure. How do you make that choice? So I had to think about it again. And um, at the end, I picked um, human gamma D crystalline. I picked this protein because um, of the name crystalline, first of all. But then, because the name is actually deceiving, uh, the name implies that it crystallizes, but it's actually um, evolved to not crystallize because it makes the eye lenses of our eyes crystal clear. And if they become crystallized, if the protein crystallizes, it actually affects our vision. Um, it's an interesting protein. It's also an example of uh, a two-domain protein where we have a domain duplication. So I depicted this these two domains. And then looking at them, I thought I should make it fun. And so I added a couple of eyes just because it had a connection to um, our eyes, actually very important for our eyes. So I added these two eyes and I thought that's really fun. Maybe that's something I will do next. And um, unlike David Goodsell and others, where um, the representation of size is really important, I kind of went, went the other way and I decided to make it a bit surreal and combine these very different scales together. Like a molecular step, scale, an invisible scale and something we can see and know every day. So another one I looked at next was not. So I thought not was an interesting prompt. Um, and I immediately thought about proteins that can fold into knots. That's very unusual. Most proteins don't do that. But there are some exceptions, and they, they found to be very curious. So I looked up, um, went back to my trusty PDB website, and I was looking for knotted proteins. I found this protein that had a really, really boring name. 
hypothetical protein MJ0366, like something from a science fiction. But what's really cool about this protein is that it folded into a knot, and not just any knot, the knot that has never been seen before in other proteins that have knots in them. Um, the function of this protein was unknown, and I was just wondering who would ever even consider solving the structure of something that may not be real or with unknown function. But then I started digging deeper and I realized that actually a protein that came from a very interesting organism. It came from an archaean that is um, thermophilic and also methanogenic. And this archaea bacteria, this archaea was actually found in um, white smokers deep in the Pacific Ocean, 2,600 meters deep in fact. And the genome of this particular archaea was um, sequenced completely. It was the first archaea that was sequenced. So from that point, I realized why they were interested in, in solving the structure. And um, I just still don't know why it folds into a knot and how it does it, because it's not a simple way um, for a person. There's not a simple way for a person to fold into a knot, but it does. And perhaps it has something to do with its unusual environment. Another example I want to show you is um, that came with the prompt raven. I tried really hard to find any proteins that come from ravens in the PDV, but I couldn't find any. But what I did find um, was a sea raven protein called SRAFP. Um, that stands for sea raven antifreeze protein. And in fact, this protein acts as an antifreeze. Um, it's fairly small and it has a lot of um, disulfide bonds that make this, make this protein way more stable than normal proteins would be. It indeed serves as an antifreeze and it's found in this beautiful fish called sea raven and it helps it to um, not freeze in icy water. So that was, I thought was really cool. So I turned it into a little fish that was um, on the hook being pulled from this freezing water. Here's another example, sprout. I realized when I got that prompt that I know nothing about um, proteins in plants or plant biology beyond what I learned in the first year, freshman year of college. And so I had to go on a hunt and search for something that's understandable to a, a non-plant biologist and interesting and it has a connection to a protein structure. So I found this beautiful beta viral protein um, called auxin binding protein one. And this protein binds to a plant hormone called auxin and regulates the growth. So I thought I'll take this and I'll maybe turn um, one of its ends to a little sprout and put it in a petri dish and I'll add some um, roots coming through it as if it's been just interacting with that um, plant hormone and just started sprouting. So this is really the most fun part of project like this. And I can see how students may really appreciate that going into this RT, RT science project because this research is, is really fascinating. And I learned so much along the way. Um, another one of my favorites actually from the, from the project that I did last year, uh, came from the prompt loop. Um, I decided to take up a beta barrel transmembrane protein called PEDP. Um, it looks like a beautiful barrel. This is the um, NMR structure of this protein. We have a beautiful ensemble here. And as, as most membrane proteins, it has quite rigid uh, beta barrel part and it has these flexible loops that stick out of the membrane um, to the surface. This particular protein came, came from E. coli, and it's an enzyme that helps in, um, that is involved in lipid synthesis. So when I looked at this protein, I thought, well, I can use these loops and make them the start of the start of a show. And I, I imagine this protein being knitted in real time, and these little loops might be the loops on the on the knitting um, needles here, with with hands going with them. I am a um, a knitter as well, so I kind of enjoyed that a lot. Um, another example is leak. The prompt leak kind of got me stuck. I couldn't quite figure out what to do. And 
I got a lot of suggestions and I really love the aquaporin idea. Aquaporin is this alpha helical transmit protein as well. Um, and it creates a channel in the hydrophobic membrane of um, in the hydrophobic membrane and creates a channel for water to go through it, shown here in red. So I thought, well, maybe I can turn it into water and um, coming out of the faucet and I turn these helices into water. And I absolutely loved as the animal spectroscopy the disorder and um, the flexibility of these termini that can really be um, an ensemble of, of multiple structures. And so here they kind of turn into turbulent water coming from the faucet. Watch. That was an interesting one. Um, when I thought about watch, I thought about the timekeeping that that we as humans do. When we travel from, you know, across the ocean, go from US to Europe or go to Asia, your body suffers and we really need to adjust and reset our internal clock. Um, and so this watch that I picked um, was a path A in the name of a circadian clock protein, cleverly called clock. Um, so I I turn it into a watch that somebody adjusting as if they just traveled through multiple time zones and need to readjust the time. Sour. So sour was an interesting one as well. Um, it was one of the hard ones actually to to figure out. Um, but I found that this fascinating protein called curcular. Um, it, it has this intriguing property that modifies the sour taste in our um, mouth into a sweet taste. I thought that was absolutely cool. I'm a diabetic, so I love sweet things, but I cannot have them. So um, I thought that was just fantastic. Um, so this particular protein is isolated from a fruit uh, that's native to Malaysia. And after consumption, it makes things like water or sour solution taste sweet. So when I drew this protein, looks like a, a, a dimer, I realized that there is a, this, this interesting opening in the middle that looked just kind of like a lemon. So I've added a lemon there to add this sour um, into, into the whole um, artwork. Compass. Um, that was, was not straightforward to do. So, uh, and I got some heat on social media for it as well. So compass, uh, for compass, I picked this protein called cry 4 which is a light dependent uh, magnetosensor, which is believed to help birds, such as a migratory bird that need to travel, uh, navigate using Earth's magnetic field. So when I looked at this protein, I turned it, turned it and turned it and turned it, and I thought it kind of looks like a bird. So like a pigeon maybe. So I've added these pigeon feet to it and added compass in the back to make it absolutely compass feet. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is pretty simple drawing um, made to the, uh, to the prompt of fan. And I was always fascinated by these proteins that uh, create propellers. You can just imagine that this complete mess of noodle kind of protein just folding perfectly into six propellers like this. They've always been fascinating for me. So I immediately turned this into a fan that uh, you can hopefully see with six propeller blades in there. So this particular protein uh, came from Keep One, which forms a perfect six blade propeller. But every um, artwork that I published, I try to always include the PDB ID so people can always find it and a reference to the paper if it's been um, referenced before. And I really did try to make it as um, true to life as possible. So not too many distortions. Connect. Um, since I'm a ubiquitin biologist, I was really thinking of including ubiquitin somehow. And the only prompt I could think of that would fit was connect because I don't know if you're familiar with ubiquitin, probably most people are. So ubiquitination is a process in which we can modify our proteins with a signal that sends them for degradation. 
sort of like a, a maintenance of um, normal protein in the cell. And there was an entire um, language of ubiquity modifications. But what all these ubiquity molecules do is they connect to each other in different ways, creating this whole ubiquitin code that will then determine the um, fate of the protein that is modified. So I turn this ubiquitin fold into this really long and twisted um, sort of connecting, um, I don't even know how to call it, but with connecting, um, A connector, extension cord, there we go, extension cord. Um, so I want to finish with this one. Um, we came with the prompt spark. I chose luciferase because my son at the time was actually taking a biology class in high school and they were doing some research with luciferase, looking at luciferase assays. And I always thought that um, proteins that glow are just fascinating. And so organisms from butterflies to bacteria actually uses these um, unusual proteins that glow and emit light, such as luciferase. And if you go on to look at the exhibit today, you'll see that many other students were inspired by glowing proteins as well. So we'll have uh, luciferase with a little firefly here. We have uh, a GFP protein, a, a green fluorescent protein, and a GFP protein in um, in this beautiful um, jellyfish. And so with this, I would like to thank everybody for your attention and welcome to the next generations of scientists and artists. Excellent, thank you very much, Irina. And thank you for giving your perspective of, of art and science and a bit of background behind those artworks. Um, so just to reiterate to everyone, um, if you have any questions for Irina or to Edith, please use the Q&A box to um to input those and we can put those towards arena and edith um but before we do the q a session we do just have um a guided tour video of the exhibition that we'd like to share with you so um, we'll just go through this first and then we'll run our q a session welcome to the pdb art exhibition 2022 the pdb art project is an outreach initiative involving nine schools two art societies and the protein data bank in Europe. We work together to inspire school students from 11 to 17 years old to learn about the 3D molecular structures in the PDB and use them to inspire the creation of artworks as part of their art curriculums. Students learn to explore and research their protein of interest and create artworks accompanied by descriptions which are showcased in this exhibition. This tool will introduce you to some of these artworks made by these young artists last year. Year 8 students from Thomas Gainsborough School created these colorful paper sculptures based on fluorescent proteins. Fluorescent protein molecules absorb radiation and emit light, making the organism look like it's glowing, often seen in jellyfish, coral and sea anemones. Some fluorescent proteins are photosuchable, meaning the organisms can turn the fluorescence on and off, like operating a light switch. This year we saw 3D artworks created by year 7 students from Eubank College, Australia. They worked in pairs to create their artwork. This glowing firefly sculpture created by Joanna Chan and Isha Patel portrays the bioluminescent luciferase protein. This enzyme catalyzes a reaction in which the chemical luciferin reacts with molecular oxygen to create light. The most inspiring thing for Joanna and Isha was being able to see the proteins as well as to see firefly come to life by adding the LED lights. At Perth School in Cambridge, Year 9 students learned about the biology and structure of three proteins, hemoglobin, keratin, and saliva minus. The students used this knowledge and explored through the PDB archive to create artworks in their art lessons. They chose to create many different forms of artworks using prints, etches, 
Photoshop and Glasswork this time, which are showcased in this exhibition. This artwork by Zara Osai on human survival amylase was inspired when she was learning about proteins and enzymes in biology lesson. Amylase interested her especially since it breaks down starch into simple sugar. Two main elements to her final piece are showcased here. A print created by etching and a glasswork which trap copper leaf wire and oxide meant to symbolize the diversity of the amylase protein. Ribozymes are RNA molecules that catalyze specific biochemical reactions including RNA splicing and gene expression, similar to the action of protein enzymes. They are like fossil records of the ancient molecular evolution of life on Earth. This 3D art by Janal Bankas of the Lee School highlights the small hinged hairpin ribozyme. Year 12 students from the Stephen Peirce Foundation School each picked up their own topic of research related to protein structures. In this artwork by Thanet Korn is based on her research into spiral seed pods and the protein lipooxygenase that is found in soya beans. Lipooxygenases are large iron containing enzymes in plants, animals, bacteria and fungi. These catalyze the oxidation of fatty acids to produce highly reactive hyperoxides. These hyperoxides are capable of altering the flavor, aroma and appearance of food. They are therefore sometimes used in food and beverage industry to improve the physical and chemical characteristics of ingredients. We are now going to explore some artworks by year 10 students from Leeuwenhoek School, Southwich. The students chose the theme of emotions and created artworks based on proteins affecting emotions. Here, Charlotte is inspired by the protein serotonin. It is known that laughter accelerates circulation and helps muscle to relax, in turn reducing stress. This is due to the release of protein called serotonin. It is understood that serotonin impacts animal cognition and behavior. Deficiency in serotonin can predispose birds to develop feather picking. This inspired Charlotte to create her artwork based on serotonin and the bird token. Keratin that is found in feathers, wool, horns, hoops, hair, claws, beaks and hair of animals is a simple coiled coiled helical structure rich in amino acid cysteine. It has the ability to self-assemble into bundles of fibers. This natural protein shows immense biological stability which proves strength to our internal organs and maintains elasticity of our skin. Roshin chose this protein because keratin is what peacock's feather are made of and linked it to the appearance of the peacock. This year, year 12 students of Saffron Golden County High created artworks based on the theme of glowing proteins like luciferase or GFP. Here, Oscar Heigham took inspiration from the graphic artist MC Escher whose art explores topics such as perspective and symmetry. And Oscar based his artwork on light-emitting fishing rod of anglerfish who have mastered a trick to light up the great depths of our ocean floors. Year 12 students from the Lee School each picked up their own topic of research. This textile work by Amelia Mitchell features a ball of wool depicting deposits which form tangles in Alzheimer's disease. In this progressive neurodegenerative disorder, the brain slowly loses memory and cognition and eventually the patient is no longer able to carry out simple day-to-day -day tasks. It is thought to be caused by the abnormal buildup of proteins in and around the brain cells. One of the proteins involved, called amyloid, can accumulate to form plaques around the brain cells. Another protein called tau forms tangles within the brain cells. Amelia exquisitely portrayed both of these proteins in this piece. While drugs may improve memory and reduce confusion moderately, there is still no cure to stop Alzheimer's disease from worsening over time. With this, 
we have come to the end of the guided tour today. Please take time to explore the other beautiful artworks which are showcased in this exhibition. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's our exhibition and we'll share the link to that at the end. So um, I'll now invite Edith and Arena to, to join us for the Q&A session. We are running a little bit over time, but we'll make sure um, we'll, we'll have a, maybe a question to each of you at least so that we're able to, um, to hear from you about those. Uh, so the first question is uh, for Edith, and that is, have you ever tried your hand at science art, scientific mm -hmm. art, or do you have a favourite scientific artist, for example? Um, that's actually that's a really interesting question. I I didn't until quite recently, um, and actually it was during the pandemic where we were trying to sort of uh, you know find ways of communicating, connecting actually with my lab. And uh, one of the Christmases, I can't remember which of the two, uh, we decided that everyone would have to uh, paint or draw something that would actually represent the biological process that my lab works on. Uh, which is this process called X inactivation. It happens in females. It, 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 it's important for dosage compensation. There's a, a long, long coding RNA that triggers it. And it was really great because I, we all did something different and we've now framed it. It's up in our lab. Um, and so I did, so I had a go. Um, and in the past, over the years, uh, I've actually often worked with scientists in my lab who know artists and who are inspired by what they hear their friends are doing. And so, you know, sometimes we've submitted um, art for covers that illustrates a particular topic. And a few times it got accepted. So I was, uh, you know, so I'm, a, I'm a, a huge believer in the power of art in communicating science and actually just listening to, you know, some of the, um, or, or listening to Irina and see me, seeing some of the examples she gave. I mean, you know, that's it. It's imprinted in my mind, some of these proteins. I'm never going to look at them or think about them in the same way again. So I think it's a very, very good way of, of transmission um, and inspiration. And just to say that, you know, my field is epigenetics. And one of the, well, the person who invented the word actually is Conrad Waddington um, in, back in the 1940s. And he was not only a um, you know, scientist, uh, paleontologist, he was also an artist. And he actually drew um, what we call epigenetic landscapes. And, and actually, the art, I'm not sure actually he did all of the art. I think he actually also commissioned someone to do them for him. But those, those figures you now see more and more often used. They were not used um, in the you know, several decades following his invention of epigenetics, but now everyone uses them. Um, so, so I think it's an extremely powerful way of uh, inspiring and, and allowing people to to think about uh, uh, different biological, you know, topics and, and issues. So, yes, that was Excellent. a long answer to a question that would have been just yes. <laughs> no, it's good to, good to know the the background behind it as well. Maybe it's something all scientists should should try their hands at. That's at right, point. but I know a few scientists who are totally appalling at art who'd love to be able to do it. But now, thanks to, you know, computers, they can actually start to be artistic as well. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, and one question before we move on to, to Arena, uh, which is what was the most challenging part of the Inktober project for you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the most difficult part was to actually do it every day um, because you don't get a break. And to be able to just continue. So I think the reason I failed so many times was because I was over ambitious. And so sometimes it's, I tried to pick something that's simple and I knew I could do, but the, the most time that I spent on it took researching the actual PDB, researching the, the proteins I'm working on this time, this day. Um, and often the drawing just came, you know, in half an hour or an hour you're done, but you spend three or four hours at night just reading about this, making sure you get it right, making sure you understand. Um, so my, my suggestion to anybody who is going to try this is not to give up and to pick something that's doable and you can honestly do in half an hour. Something simple. It doesn't have to be perfect at all. And it's okay to create something that you hate, 
or I'm not very proud of that day, as long as you've done it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so in, in the interest of time, I think maybe we'll move on from the, the Q&A part. But if anyone does have any more questions for, for Edith or Arena, feel free to, to keep sending them our way. We can forward them on or, or contact Arena on, on Twitter, I'm sure. It's a good way to get, get in contact as well. So um, I'd like to say thank you both again for joining us um, and for participating in, in this event. Um, so the next part, I'm going to hand over to Deepti Gupta who is managing the PDB Art project here at PDBE. Um, so firstly, I'd like to say a big thank you for Deepti for, for what she's done with the project and for again, um, helping to, to have a, a really brilliant year and some fantastic artworks. And she's always hard at work coordinating teachers and students and getting those artworks in. So thank you very much, Deepti. And then I'll hand over to you for the next session. Uh, thank you so much, Dave, for your kind words. I have really enjoyed coordinating this fantastic project uh, for more than five years now. And what amazes me all the time is the fantastic artworks, you know, we have got uh, year on year from these truly outstanding students and teachers. Um, so this year we wanted to com commemorate the students and uh, we held a competition for the very first time to select the best artwork. Uh, and rather than selecting just the best artwork, we have two categories. Um, uh, the best artwork for under 16 uh, years of age students, uh, you know, from ranging from year seven onwards, seven to 11, and um, those students who are over 16 year of age. So, so to reveal who has the who has won the under 16 award goes to Joanna Chan and Isha Patel for the Fireflies Lucifer structure from Eubank College, Australia. I know that they, they, it's, it's well past midnight for um, Aus Australians, uh, you know, down under. So uh, I'm sure when they wake up in the morning, um, both uh, Joanna and Isha will be totally surprised. And plus on Isha, uh, who is our collaborator, uh, in, in Australia who has uh, coordinated this project with Bank College Australia. She would be very pleased as well. So they both get uh, a certificate and a 50 pound voucher. Um, this will cover their art supplies for the year. And we hope that they continue, you know, making these wonderful artworks in the future as well and, and keep on taking signs as well. So the next uh, goes to uh, Siki Lee from Stephen Purse Foundation, Cambridge. Uh, she got the award for making this digital artwork uh, based on GFP, which are genetically encoded by sensors. So I would like to invite uh, the teacher, Emma Wilshaw, who, you know, coordinated this project with the school students. And um, they have been brilliant and outstanding this year. So Emma, would you say a few words uh, for on Siki's behalf. Yes, I'd be delighted to. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to thank you, Deepti, and your team for making this project possible for students like Siki, who have an interest in both art and science. And to my head of department, Rachel Bloomfield Proud, who let me work with the students on it at Stephen Purse Foundation. Um, it's with really fantastically great pride that I congratulate you, Siki. I know that you're on the call uh, for your fantastic piece of artwork. It's really great. You've worked so hard on this piece, which is mostly hand drawn on Procreate with some really brilliant effects. And you've been such an engaged student all the way through the PDB art project, right from the first live session with Deep T and David last October. Your artwork will help to communicate the important scientific research that the Protein Data Bank does to loads of people who otherwise wouldn't just be aware of that. So you've done something really special in making this artwork, which also brings together the subjects of art and science, which are often seen as separate by students. 
Um, so it's great that you can combine the two together in this way and show scientific theory in such a beautiful way. I'm really thrilled that you've won this prestigious competition and your piece of work is, is really amazing. Really well done to you, Siki. I'm very proud of you. Thank you so much, Emma, uh, for, for your kind words. And, and Siki, I know you are here. So congratulations to you. Very well done and very well deserved. So we will hand over the voucher in, in coming days. Uh, it will come to you so you can buy some art supplies. Okay, so moving on. Um, I know uh, not many of you would, would know where the art project lives on our website. So I thought I, I'll just give you a, 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 a two minute uh, introduction on the website. So we now have a have a page dedicated for the art project. And if you do the drop down menu, you can see all these um, um, uh, parts uh, like exhibition and artworks and exhibition in the media resources evaluation and collaborators uh, you know everything for the art project is in in this section and because we are running out of time I would just quickly show you that under the exhibition section you can now visit the current 2022 uh, virtual PDB art exhibition and this is the short link if you want to make a note of it so I do encourage you to please go and visit uh, the beautiful exhibition, you know, with wonderful artworks that the students have created this year. Uh, we also have a resources page, which um, many of you would have not seen, but um, here they are. We have created worksheets and activities and video tutorials. Um, and also we, we frequently write featured structure articles and highlight each month um, uh, a protein on which the artwork is based on. So I, I do encourage you to, you know, have a look. It's wonderful. Uh, we also have uh, our social media presence. So if you would like to promote the project, um, you know, do hashtag us wherever you can. And then uh, finally, before we wrap up, I would like to thank our speakers today, Professor Edith Hurd and Dr. Irina Petsonova for their enlightening talks. I have thoroughly enjoyed and I'm sure you, you all must have thoroughly enjoyed the talks uh, they gave today. I would also like to thank Brian Eve, our public engagement officer here at EBI, who has helped us um, all throughout, you know, any kind of suggestions, support we need, Bryony is always there. And so is Oana, our, our head of communication. So thank you to you both uh, and all the comms team uh, who have, uh, you know, taken on, the, uh, taken on the project to next level by promoting it um, through, through their social media. I would also like to thank the Emble EBI training team for helping us host this exhibition today. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I'm really on, you know, thankful to you. I would also like to thank the funding uh, bodies who have supported the project. Uh, the, our, our internal Emble EBI budget has supported and also the uh, comms team, uh, the connecting science team, the welcome genome connecting science team who have helped us uh, with a lot of uh, uh, support in the past and have always helped with the student visit on campus and the welcome trust grant without which, you know, this project could not be run. Uh, I would like to thank all the schools, all the nine schools uh, that are on the project and the teachers without which, you know, this project could not be run. Uh, your tremendous efforts have led the project to where we are today and every year uh, the numbers keep on increasing. So thank you so much for your support and help. And lastly, but not the last, uh, the students themselves, you know, without whom we could not show the exhibition. We would not have any artworks. So well done to all of you. Um, so before you go, I would like to um, have your feedback. Uh, so do visit us. Uh, at the, the, the short link for the virtual exhibition is over here. So do visit the exhibition. And once you leave the webinar, you would be left with a 
post event survey that should automatically open and i would be very grateful to you if you could take few minutes and give us your thoughts about how you found the project and the event today and this would help us in future planning uh, of the events so please do take time to fill in the survey well uh, we have come to the end and thank you so much for all those who attended and i'm sure we will promote this on our social media channel so do look out for for the event and promote the exhibition where you can among your channels because we want to bring the project um, and reach out as far as possible around the globe so that more students could be inspired each year well i hope you enjoyed the opening event today thank you all for you know staying with us and i hope you have a good evening bye bye